and I was trying to spit out a, I'm sorry. I was so overcome with emotion and fear, just fear that I couldn't even get it out. And my father stopped me and he says, listen, just do what you got to do and give us our son back. With that, I got out of the car and I've never had to drink again. I have the great privilege of speaking to Father Ryan Brady, who struggled, battled with addiction, with alcohol for years. And by the grace of God, he found freedom and liberation. I heard his story. His addiction has touched my own life. My father was an alcoholic. I've had other relatives that struggled with drug addiction. And I'm telling you, prayer works for any parent out there praying for their child or for their spouse. Prayer does work. God can heal, but he also gives us the mechanisms to bring about that healing too. And that's why you need sometimes therapy or AA or whatever it might be. Father, first of all, great to have you in the studio with me. It's Thank you. Great to have you. Your story, I think, is going to touch a lot of hearts. Bring us back. I, I know you were in seminary at the age of 17, right? You went right in. Do you always feel that call to religious life? Not always. I went to Marist High School on the southwest side of Chicago, and the founder of the Marist Brothers was canonized in 1999. To celebrate that canonization, Cardinal George came to celebrate Mass for us. I was the sacristan in the school, and I did it to get out of class. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to meet Cardinal George, and it just changed my life. Yeah. Here I was, a teenager, a young kid, and, and he just gave me his time, and he was so kind to me, and he promised to pray for me. And then we ran into each other some other place some time later. And he, he remembered you. And it floored me because he's got such a great memory, but the kindness of a priest. And then I began to understand a little more about the priesthood. And so I actually applied to seminary straight from high school. And I entered seminary at 17 years old. And I wasn't ordained until two years ago when I was 37. Wow. I left at 20 years old and ended up going back to seminary at 34. And a lot took place between then. I began to realize later in life, I had a problem, even at 20 years old, that I thought, I'm just being a 20-year-old. Yeah. And there were other 20-year-olds acting that way, and let's be frank, just drinking that way. Yeah. And they grew up, and I couldn't. I had crossed a line. I don't know where. I don't know when. But it was a line that you're not able to uncross yeah. when it comes to drinking. It was no longer a social function. It wasn't a social thing. It wasn't necessarily even a requirement or a need right off the bat, but it was never normal. And I lived my 20s really struggling to find out who I was, but the problem was addiction runs through your brain like a freight train, and you can't hear the Lord's still soft voice that speaks to you. You have to turn that noise down, I should say, to hear that voice. And, and addiction, it just continues to rage like thunder in your head, and you can't think, and it's so hard to pray, and you feel alone. Addiction is a disease of isolation. I had friends. And I had great relationships with my family and friends and what have you, but they began to suffer the worse my addiction became. And I began to push people away. And in a strange way, I couldn't imagine being lovable. I knew God was all loving and kind. He had to love me. And then eventually, the last people left were those who had to love me, my parents, my brothers. But anybody who could have run, I thought would have and did. But people still loved me and prayed for me and cared for me, even from a distance. I think they saw that I had a problem. Typically with addiction, the last person to know is the addict. And at 30 years old, after a good decade of real problems, soul-searching, because I had this addiction. Were you a functioning alcoholic? Were, oh, yeah. Were you able to hold down a job? Or what did you do from 20 to 30, or were you just a mess? Yeah, so I, I finished my degree at Loyola University, yeah. Chicago, and I worked, and I bounced from job to job. It, it was hard to keep a job, Yeah. but I would go, and I would do work. I would put forth the effort, but I was just unsettled. It was hard to find meaning. It was hard to find purpose. It was hard to find joy in anything, really. And I blamed it on, this isn't the right job, right. or this isn't the right career, or this isn't the right vocation. So there was a real dis-ease in all that I had, That's in all that I'd point. done, because of the disease. That's such a great line. So you're now 30 years of age. You've been dealing with this for 10 years. And what happened? Did it get progressively worse, or did you stay pretty much the same? It got progressively worse, and then came the consequences that you can't look away from. You, know. you can drink a lot and say, well, I just have a high tolerance, yeah. or I drink a lot, but other people drink less. But when the consequences start to come, it's getting more and more difficult to deny. Yeah. I remember driving home from work, and I say, well, I'm going to go a different way today home because I don't want to stop at this tavern. And I'd huh. say, I won't stop, I won't stop, and I kept going in the same way. 
And uh, I, said, well, I won't turn into the lot as the turn signal comes on. Uh, and as I'm pulling into the lot, I'll say, I won't get out of the car. And as I'm getting out of the car, I'll say, I won't open the door to the tavern. And as I'm opening the door to the tavern, I'll say, I won't walk to the bar. And as I'm walking up to the bar, I'll say, well, I won't order a drink. And as I order the drink, I say, well, I won't drink it. And as that cold drink was sitting right mm. in front of me, I took a sip of it and I said, ooh, that's the best decision I made all day. <laughs> and you're off to the races again. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a powerlessness that yeah. that really is incredibly amazing. How it just, it saturates into everything that you do, everything you think about, mm. all your decision making. It revolves around this power that is alcohol and the disease that comes with the alcoholism. Is addiction, and I know you, you battled it, is there a demonic element to it? I think there's a psychological, there's a woundedness that so often people have. There are people who self-medicate for all sorts of reasons. It's very easy to get into a vice, a habitual pattern of doing something very negative. These are hooks that I sometimes, I think Satan likes to put into you. Yeah, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And addiction pulls us away from that, pulls us away from any semblance of hope. Yeah, Definitely the evil one takes part in, in yeah. this destruction of an individual's self-worth, of an individual's life and family. The evil one is alive and well in our world, and mm -hmm. I think sometimes we discount the evil one's presence in what we call this disease. And it is a disease, but the yeah. evil one definitely plays a part in all of it. What was your job, by the way? What were you doing at that point in time? So I was working for a manufacturing company in the southwest side. Interesting. And you've always, did you still feel the call to religious life? Did you feel God was calling you to something? He said, Ryan, I want you. I knew God wanted to be a part of my life. Yeah. I knew that God loved me. I just didn't know how to figure out how to accept it. I was working at that manufacturing company listening to Relevant Radio. Yeah. I was struggling with my addiction and I was listening to Relevant Radio. I was struggling with my addiction and I was going to Mass. I was struggling with my addiction and yeah. praying very desperately that God would just make the pain go away. Wow. But not the alcohol, ah. but the pain. Wow. I wanted freedom on my terms. And the Lord was holding out until I would abandon all hope in anything but him. Wow. And then he gave me that great gift. You had to be brought to your knees. Exactly. That's wow. that rock bottom that we speak of. I was always searching. I was always searching for meaning and for purpose. I ended up in mortuary school. I had wonderful people in my life who were supporting me and saying, look, if only you find your place in life and you'll find peace. Yeah. And I was in mortuary school and we practiced embalming the indigent. We would embalm the indigent of Cook County. And I was there and I was in scrubs and I'm in the, the Cook County Medical Examiner's office and we were preparing to embalm this woman who died nameless mm. on the street with no name. Nobody claimed her. Nobody knew who she was. And I looked down at her in the most vulnerable moment of her existence. Nobody knew who she was. Yeah. And I was jealous of her. Wow. I was jealous that she didn't have to live the way that I have to live now. And if addiction wow. was part of her story, she was free from it. It wasn't the liberation from addiction that she wanted, but it was liberation from addiction nonetheless. And I was jealous. And then I would go off and I'd be in rooms full of people. And I was a bar room drinker and I would look at these people and I would know who they are. I would know what their wives' names are, their children's name. I would know what their bosses' names were because they typically complain about them. <laughs> But I would know so much about all of these people, and I just felt so incredibly alone. Yeah. Addiction is a disease of isolation, yeah. and I felt alone. I couldn't live that way anymore. So I, I just, I had gotten in enough trouble with my family, with my friends, with everyone. I got in enough trouble with myself. I yeah. couldn't live within my own skin anymore. I went to a meeting with other people who struggled the same way I did. My father drove me. So that first meeting way out, I went far away. I didn't want people to know that I was going. <laughs> I still wanted it to be my secret. That's great. We had suffered a lot as a family. I think people who look at a loved one who is suffering from addiction, they suffer almost more than the addict. That's so true. That's because so they, true. with clear eyes, they yep. see this person suffer who they love right yeah, in front of them. Absolutely. But the addict is so muddled in their thinking. So we go to the meeting. My father's going to drop me off. And I've ruined their lives in my mind. He drops me off, and I look to my left to get out the door before I left, and I was trying to spit out a, I'm sorry. I was so overcome with emotion and fear, just fear, that I couldn't even get it out. My father stopped me, and he says, listen, just do what you got to do and give us our son back. Wow. With that, I got out of the car, and wow. I've never had a drink again. Wow. 
I've tried my best to do that, not only to my father and mother mm -hmm. and my brothers, but to our father in heaven as well, to give him his son back too. What was that first meeting like? I was angry because when I went in, everybody was smiling and laughing and having a good time. And I thought, how dare you smile and laugh and have a good time? I'm having the worst day of my life. But they taught me how to begin to have the best days of my life. Yeah. And I felt at home. As people began to talk, I realized you're just like me. Yeah. I'm not so terminally unique. Yeah. Your problems are like mine. And that's when I found real liberation. Yeah. I don't suffer alone. And that broke that disease yeah. of isolation. It's amazing. I sit here across from you, Catholic priest, you're in your blacks, you're clear. And I say it all the time on the air that God brings good out of every situation. Your parents, your brother, your family, people around you, anyone who's got addiction in their family, you think, how is God ever going to change this person's life? How, what good will ever come from this? But here you are now serving others in such a profound and beautiful way. And it's, it's such an inspiration. Is there anything good that you can point to that came out of your addiction? everything that I have in my life. I remember being somewhere and someone said, I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I thought they needed to see a psychiatrist. How could that be possible? Now I know my addiction is the best thing never happened to me. Yeah. My addiction is the best thing to happen to my priesthood. Wow. I began to realize that our sins, our past, yep. they're not a hindrance to our holiness. It wasn't for Mary Magdalene. It wasn't for St. Augustine or yeah. St. Monica, St. Venerable Matt Talbot. There's a saying out there, the greatest saints often start as the greatest sinners. That's right. And I get to share that message. But not only share it, I, just by breathing and staying alive and staying sober, you share it just by being there. If there was only justice in this world and not God's divine mercy, I'd be a full-time resident yeah. at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery, yeah. not at St. Linus and Our Lady of the Ridge. I'm able to thrive and to love because of my past sins and my past struggles, not in spite of them. One of the other great gifts is that some of the best men and women I've ever met in my entire life, I've met through addiction recovery. Wow. The greatest gift that God has ever given me is on the main level of the church. It's in the Eucharist. The second greatest gift God has ever given me is typically found in the basements of the churches. Wow. And some of the wisest things I've ever heard, I've heard from people in the basements of churches. You've learned to laugh again, have you? Yeah, that's, it's funny that you mentioned that. I remember sitting in a tavern one time and I tucked myself away in the darkness so that no one could see me and I was crying. Here I am, a grown man, crying in a bar by himself. And I was hopeless. And I came to the realization that I would never laugh again. Wow. And that's why I was jealous when I went into that meeting and people were laughing and smiling. I was angry with them because they were doing what I was not going to be able to do for the rest of my life. Addiction from recovery has given me my laugh back. Wow. And I love that. Because this is my story, and there's a lot of sadness to it, but boy, oh boy, is there a ton of joy. And there's a ton of good, and there are tons of miracles, and I see them all the time. 